Now, in this progression, I want to come to the sayings of Jesus regarding the clash of these kingdoms and the signs he he prophesied that would happen uh, at the time when this conflict between the kingdoms boils over and becomes entirely visible and uh, engaged in the earth. Uh, For that, I want to give a set of readings from the prophetic words of Jesus. I want to start, and I'll go in chronological order, beginning with Matthew 24. Then I'll read from Mark, from Luke, and from John. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, it begins with verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, that not one stone shall be left here upon another that will not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then, and many will be offended and will betray one another, and hate one another, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Now, I will come back to this, but let me read uh, some more readings from the book of Mark. And we'll read in chapter 13, we'll start at verse 1, and we'll, we'll follow that. Jesus had gone out from the temple, and uh, The disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So they were very proud of the the temple buildings. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives. So the picture we get is this. Jesus had been in the temple complex They were leaving the site of the temple and that's the point at which some said, look at how beautiful these buildings are, look at these massive foundation stones. I happen to have seen some of these stones and they are indeed massive. And Jesus prophesied, not one of these stones will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. And in the minds of the disciples, that, that was an impossibility that could only be explained by the cataclysm of the end of the age also coming at that same time. 
Now, history tells us that it did not require the cataclysm of the end of the age for the temple to be overthrown, overturned, not one stone <coughs> left upon another. There was a thin sheet of gold that was placed on the roof of the temple and when the Romans burned the temple in AD 70, the, the molten gold flowed down and some collected between the cracks of the stones and the rumor arose that the Jews had used gold as mortar for the stones of the temple. And so overworked and underpaid legionnaires sensing an opportunity for a bonus payday worked together in teams to overthrow every stone. Not one stone was left upon another, regardless of how massive the stones of the, of the building of the temple were. But it was inconceivable to the disciples of Jesus that not to want the prophecy concerning not one stone being left upon another, that that prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled. Or in, in, the only way they could foresee that prophecy being fulfilled was if it also consummated the age and concluded with the return of the Lord. So later they were on the Mount of Olives. So the picture is that they left the temple complex, walked down the path toward the east, crossed the valley of Kidron, crossed the brook of Kidron, off to the left is where the Garden of Gethsemane is, and they went up the hill to the Mount of Olives. When he sat on the Mount of Olives, where Matthew just says his disciples came to him privately, Mark says it was Peter, James, John and Andrew who asked him privately, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are fulfilled? Apparently they also said what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. <clears throat> and Jesus answering said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. And he continues on with essentially the same narrative as that we've just read in uh, Matthew. He moves on to say, you'll be, hear wars, rumors of war, see to it you're not troubled. These things must happen but the end is not yet because kingdom will rise against kingdom uh, or nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, um, famines uh, and troubles, this adds, troubles. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. Um, troubles there would be the term Terach, Terache, T -E -R -A -C -H -E, T-E-R-A-C-H-E, Terache, which means roiling or disturbance or sedition. And in, uh, I'll read you the third piece from Luke, and Luke's reference will be to the roaring and tossing of the sea. This was Luke 21 and it'll be from verses 5 through uh, 36. Again, this adds uh, color and, and greater texture to the prophetic words. I'm getting to something obviously. Then as they spoke of the temple, how it was beautifully adorned, with beautiful stones and decorations, Jesus said, this is from Luke 21, 5, these things you see, the days will come in which not one stone will be left upon another which will not be thrown down. So they asked him, teacher, when will these things be and what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now, left out of this narrative is that they had departed from the temple complex, that Peter, James, John and Andrew had come to Jesus 
while he sat on the Mount of Olives and asked him these things. And the way Luke frames it is, when will these things take place? He doesn't include the more definitive statements, what, when will these things be? What will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? But as he continues on, we see essentially the same record. Take heed that you are not deceived. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. The time has drawn near. So he prophesies. He prophesies people will be foretelling his coming before he comes. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, namely Jesus is the Christ, and that the time has drawn near. So one of the signs of the end of the age is a lot of people prophesying that Jesus is coming back. Now unless you are speaking from the Spirit of God, you will be debunked routinely. Like 88 reasons why Jesus would come in 88 or John Hagee's blood moons, you will be routinely shown to be false, not speaking for him and in fact deceiving because he said, take heed that no one deceives you by telling you the time has drawn near or I am the Christ and the time has, uh, Christ is Christ, the hearing from God and the time has drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings for my name's sake, but it may turn out well for you in every occasion. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. In other words, you will be able to speak what I give you to say, don't meditate beforehand on what you're going to say, I'll give you the answer, put the word of wisdom in your mouth. You will be hated by all the nations because of me, but not a hair on your head will be lost, but your patience, by your patience you'll possess your souls. Now, then he tells them, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and so on. Now, let me come back and unpack this for you and let's use the book of Matthew, the first in this chronological order. By the way, let me just reference one more thing from the book of uh, John. Uh, because it bears witness with the rest of this chronology. And this is from John chapter 16 verses 1 through 28. He begins by saying, they'll put you out of the synagogues, they'll kill you, whoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. And so he says, these things I've told you beforehand so that when they happen you'll remember. And then he goes on to give many more signs uh, toward the end of the age, but he speaks this in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. I will tell you plainly about the Father. And in that day you will ask in my name and I will do whatever you say uh, and and I will do what you ask. I wanted to highlight that in the midst of this, all of this, that 
Jesus acknowledges that some of what he's saying, or at least what he's saying, is figurative. The point being, there is a duality of reference continuously throughout all of the preceding narratives of the book of Revelation, excuse me, of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that speak of the return of the Lord. He is saying, some of what I'm, at least some of what I'm saying, I'm saying figuratively. Now, let's go back and unpack it from Matthew. The first thing they asked him was, when when shall these things be? Because they had asked the question, or or Jesus had said to them, you see all these stones, you see all these beautiful buildings and the wonderful adornments that you are so proud of? Not one stone will be left here upon another that will not be thrown down. When Peter, James, John, and Andrew then caught up with him on the Mount of Olives, it's obvious they had been discussing what he meant by what he had said amongst themselves. And so when he sat down with them on the Mount of Olives, they presented him with the questions and they conflated all three issues, or the the two issues of the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem itself by extension, I might add, because he brought it up in the Luke account, Luke 21. Jesus brought it up himself. They conflated the destruction of the temple as part and parcel of the destruction of Jerusalem with the overthrowing of every stone with the coming, with the return of the Lord and the end of the age. But Jesus began by addressing the signs of his coming and the end of the age, and then he moved backward to talking to his disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he further talked to them about things they would experience in their lifetimes and then he talked to them about things that would happen beyond their lifetime, which things are what John builds upon in the book of Revelation because, guess what? John was one of the four, or five rather, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So one of the four with Jesus on the Mount of Olives when he was talking to them about these things. Now subsequently, John was given further revelation of these things concerning the culmination of the age at a time when, when, by the way, Peter and James and Andrew and even Paul had, had already died. By the writing of the book of Revelation, these others had already died. John was the last remaining apostle. So there's a continuity between what Jesus spoke on the Mount of Olives to them and what John picks up on and is given revelation about when he's taken into heaven. So to say that these things were all about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 is absolutely bogus. It's not accurate and it artificially limits the view, the prophetic view, that some scholars have chosen to advocate. No, he's talking about a time according to Revelation chapter 5, about verse 13, where a song is sung to Jesus that he has gathered men, he redeemed, he purchased men for God from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. That would be beyond the Roman Empire and it'd be beyond the time of John. And he formed them into a royal priesthood and a holy nation that would track all the way back to the original intent of God to have a kingdom comprised of people of every tribe, language, tongue, and nation. So it's the conclusion of the age actually. Now for our purposes, there are some remarkable signs for us to unpack. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives then, 
he said to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, whether there are others who were hearing, we don't know, but we know specifically those because they said, it is said, that is said. He said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. So the first thing to note is a spirit of deception that defines the character of the age. Why? Because it's a kingdom based in deception from the beginning. All right? So when this kingdom reaches its apogee and is about to be judged, what is going to be its last gasp effort? The spirit of deception will have ripened. But this time, the deception will be an attempt to seduce, if it were possible, even the very elect. But that's not new because Adam was God's appointed viceroy. And when the enemy came into the garden, he attacked God's viceroy with deception. So he's going to attack the kingdom of God and the saints in the end of the age with deception. Instead of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good, or uh, eating from yeah, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he's going to lie about who Christ is and when he's coming to deceive many. Because when Jesus doesn't come, as these prognosticators have routinely said, what happens? Exactly the condition that we have here today. People don't believe anymore. In in Y2K, in the year 2000, many denominations went on record. I remember many of the Calvary Chapel preachers from California and, and others went on record talking about how this was going to be the sign that begins the return of the Lord. And many of their teachers, and they weren't the only ones, numerous others, started businesses to sell freeze-dried foods and encourage people to buy all kinds of prepper, preppers' supplies. But after he didn't come, many of these famous figures were dethroned. You see, we forget these things because we never hold anybody to account. They keep on going, even after they've participated in deception. And then, we had, uh, we had the blood moons of John Hagee and nobody holds him to account. But many will come trying to deceive people about the return of the Lord. So much so. The deception is when people have been routinely deceived, they give up hope. They stop talking about the return of the Lord. And in fact, the scriptures say, they are scandalized. They are scandalized by those who preach about the return of the Lord. Uh, it says many will be offended. And the word for offended uh, is the word scandalizo, which is to be offended or scandalized. They will say, how dare we bring such disrepute that's Matthew 24, 10, that says they will be scandalized. How dare we talk about the return of the Lord? How gauche, how out of step. That's actually where we've come to. And the voice, the prophetic voice has been largely muted because people are afraid of the blowback from believers who would be scandalized that we're dragging them again into this mix. But again, I say to you, Without the words of sent ones, you have only people who are capable of deceiving and people who are capable of embarrassing in these times. But he said, here's how you'll know. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. 
And what's also added are troubles and Luke translates it and the roaring and tossing of the sea which on one level, a natural level, means uh, tsunamis and on another level it means humans as the sea of nations in distress, so much so that their hearts fail them for fear because they have no solutions to this cascading of events. All these are the beginning of sorrows and the term sorrows there is the word odin, O-D-I-N, it's pronounced odin and it means birth pangs. I remember I told you in one of the earlier broadcasts that in the reference in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that the day will come upon the unbelievers as birth pangs on a pregnant woman, this speaks to birth pangs, beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you'll be hated by all the nations for my sake. And many will be offended, that's scandalizo, and will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because lawlessness will abound, the love of most will become cold, but he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. After that he goes on to talk about things that relate to the fall of Jerusalem, which is uh, then you will see the abomination that causes desolation and so on. After that he assures his disciples and then after that he speaks and concludes about the end of the age. So when I come back with the final broadcast in this series, I want to specifically unpack these verses that I've read to you from the book of Matthew chapter 3 uh, beginning at verse 4. We'll continue on then uh, in the next broadcast. This is very important, so, so hear it all.